So, today my lecture is on approach to endocrinology. Uh, as you know, clinical medicine, uh, when you are approaching to the patient, we are going mainly in three methods of examination. First is infection, second is palpation, third is percussion, fourth is auscultation. And in endocrinology, I think inspection is the most important way because most of the patients of endocrinology having so much features, salient features, which most of the time by inspection you can detect. If you do not see the patients properly by inspection, a large number of patients of endocrinology may be missed uh, as a clinical diagnosis and you can have a problem for by having a diagnosis uh, without, with investigation and which most of the time investigation are not streamlined. So, non-specific uh, uh, information and non-specific investigation causes more harm for diagnosing the case of endocrinology. Now, why the term has come? It is come inside the entomological uh, idea of uh, endocrine. Endo means inside, Greek means crino, crino means to separate and in a better or wider meaning it is to secrete. So endocrinology in means that inside secretion of some materials. Now glands that secrete internally or endocrine glands of the bodies are various like pituitary, thyroid, pancreas, testes and ovary, parathyroid, suprarenal. There are some other glands which are though work as an endocrine organ, but uh, they also produce exocrine as well like pancreas. They have got both function as well as a both endocrine and exocrine function. Now you can jolly well see where we are uh, putting there that uh, every person has got uh, this uh, or, uh, I mean, endocrine system in our body most important is the hypothalamus and probably is you have passed this part uh, because uh, you can see the uh, this has been taught in the in even in the higher secondary classes or even in the first year or second year MBBS classes. Thyroid, adrenal, hypothalamus, parathyroid, ovaries, testes, adrenals, these are all organs and the, this is a pictorial depiction of the organs that produces endocrine uh, hormones by uh, this part of the endocrine system. Now what is the feedback loop? Feedback loop is the hypothalamus, hypothalamus to uh, thyroid releasing hormone, then to anterior pituitary, anterior pituitary by the action of TRH produce a large amount of TSH and TSH produces thyroid. And this thyroid both T3 and T4 has got power, probably T3 has got more power for the inhibition, inhibitory feedback to decrease the release of both from the hypothalamus and from the pituitary, pituitary the hormones that is responsible for the production of thyroid hormone. The hormones produced by the hypothalamus is TRH or thyroid releasing hormones. And from the anterior, anterior pituitary, it is TSH, thyroid stimulating hormones. And these two hormones are inhibited by the feedback of the excess hormone in the blood, both T4 and T3, which has got a profound action as an inhibitory feedback action on hypothalamus as well as anterior pituitary. Now increase in the circulatory insulin was good feedback loop, I am sorry, this is one first feedback loop, then another feedback loop is your feedback loop 2, increase in the about the insulin, increase in the insulin or circulatory insulin, what does it do? Actually the main crux of this problem is the blood glucose. If the patient has got increased blood glucose, then what will happen? and if the patient has got decrease in blood glucose, what will happen? The, if the blood patient has got increased blood glucose, what will happen? They stimulate pancreas to secrete glucagon. 
that increases circulatory glucagon. And this circulatory glucagon, what do, does they do? The breakdown of the glycogen in the liver. And it is by this glycogen in the liver release of glucose to blood. And this blood which is released in the blood increases the blood glucose. So it is another feedback loop. On the other hand, if the patient has got a blood sugar which is more in the blood, what will happen? The stimulate pancreas to secrete more insulin. This increase in the circulatory insulin will go to uptake of glucose by cells. This uptake of glucose by the cells causes metabolic energy, fat synthesis and glycogenic synthesis. And this glucose uptake by the cells and other metabolic activity decreases the blood sugar. So we can find that as two loops, feedback loop 2 by which increase in the blood sugar is controlled whereas decrease in the blood sugar is also maintained. And this is a method how the euglycemic state is maintained in a patient who are hyperglycemic or hypoglycemic, the other hormones in the body by the mechanism, by the metabolism, by the uptake of the glucose in the cell and release of the some hormones like glucagon can make a hemostasis of the sugar, uh, blood glucose. Now another feedback is the feedback loop 3. What is that? It's a gestaglomerular cells that is very, very important. There is, if there is excess catecholamines or macular densa feedbacks, then juxtaglomar cells are altered according to. A catecholamine particularly increases the renin release from the uh, um, uh, juxtaglomerular apparatus, which contains mostly juxtaglomerular cells. This renin release causes angiotensinogen to angiotensin 2, uh, 1, and followed by angiotensin 2. And this angiotensin 2 also increases the release of aldosterone. Aldosterone has got a peculiar action. They decreases the release of the potassium. And by decreasing the release of the potassium, the potassium level in the blood increases. Renal potassium excre excretion decreases. And thereby they maintain a homeostasis or increase blood potassium like uh, potassium level or hyperkalemia. On the other hand, aldosterone also causes renal sodium retention along with potassium problem. Renal re sodium retention, circulating blood volume also increases, renal perfusion pressure also increases and thereby juxtaglomerular apparatus is affected. So once the hypovolemia, catecholamine excess, any of the two, there will be production of or activation of the juxtaglomerular cells. Juxtaglomerular cells and catecholamine having a feedback from macular densa feedback, they altered the sodium potassium in vivo or in vitro and thereby they maintain the feedback loop. So what is happening? The juxtaglomerular cell is the main hormones, they releases is the main, uh, main area organ from was renin is released. Renin causes angiotensin to angiotensin 1, angiotensin to angiotensin 2, angiotensin 2 make the aldosterone, aldosterone make the potassium, potassium as well as sodium and if there is sodium is hypovolemia or decreased sodium or hyperkalemia, this will negative feedbacks along, along with the circulating blood volume and renal perfusion pressure to juxtaglomerous cell producing more hormone release from the juxtra glomerular cells. So endocrine disease can be monoglandular or polyglandular. You can see it can have occurs simultaneously or one by one after other the um, more glands are affected or lifelong only single glands may be affected. Thyroid, pituitary and supranal are the two, three glands which are most affected by the monoglandular uh, affection of the endocrine glands. Now before going to further, this is one gland which is very important for us is your pituitary. And I must mention about the Cian syndrome. So every female patient that is having uh, um, lactational failure patient has menstrual failure and patients has got a features of hypothyroidism which is most time the, the secondary or suprathyroid uh, hypothyroidism 
then you should consider uh, this patient as a patient of Sihan syndrome or ischemic change, ischemic infarction of the pituitary gland that causes very delayed very problem of the production of the pituitary hormones. And this monoglandular affection of the pituitary, particularly anterior pituitary with a hormonal uh, decrease, particularly the ACTH, the FSHLH, the growth hormone and thyroid hormone all can produce as the patient features of panhypopituitarism. This panhypopituitarism in a female patient with a very good relations between the bad obstetric history as well as the delayed appearance of different hormone production is a features of Sian syndrome which is very very important and the presentation is very varied. Sometimes they present with anemia, sometimes they present recurrent abdominal pain and vomiting and all these things. Now, what is the thyroid problem? There are two groups, you know, that is also known to you for a long time, but I am just uh, going through it, that is hypothyroidism and hyperthyroidism. Hypothyroidism is most of the time missed. A GI disturb, maybe atypical presentation are more varied than the typical presentation. Loss of hair, feeling cold, having some goiter or in enlargement of the thyroid, high cholesterol, constipated, dry skin and hair and brittle nails and muscles or joints become very uh, tender or very painful sometimes and there is changes in the obstruct uh, menstrual cycle uh, in the form of in the early phase they produces more menstruation I mean the menorrhagia where in the, uh, in the later phase this will produce amenorrhea. Now there is slow heart rate also important fatigue and mood changes including the patient have got loss of memory and sometimes features like a dementia can also a presentation of hypothyroidism. But sometimes it happens that only the patient comes with the hoarseness of voice or sometimes with the obesity and a good number of patients of hypothyroidism may present with only features which is very difficult uh, to be decided and we have to take with us even a very uh, subtle clinical suspicion the patient's blood thyroid level I mean uh, thyroid profile should be done in all patients whom you are suspecting the patient is obese patient has got hypercholesterol or the patient has got very bad skin dry and uh, uh, um, hair and brittle nails so including uh, on that basis we, we sometimes try to uh, uh, do the test of thyroid profile. Now, another very important the hyperthyroidism, which is, all, which is also usually presented with the, the bulging eyes, fine brittle hair and hair loss, also increased pers perspiration, enlarged th thyroid, enlarged liver, abnormal heart rhythm, particularly atrial fibrillation in the elderly, very important. Any patients having a uh, atrial fibrillation or high heart rate in the elderly, please think of the patient has got hyperthyroidism. Increased appetite, loss of libido also a problem, hand tremor and particularly hand sweating, warm hand is a very important imp uh, information for a patient having hyperthyroidism. So what we have to do, all patient who has got a very bad uh, hyperthyroidism is very frank for all physician. But subtle changes like the elderly patient having persistent atrial fibrillation, persistent supraventricular tachycardia or sinus tachycardia, then you have to think the patient is having hyperthyroidism. Now, these are the things very, very classical. You can see adrenals has got two. If it is a hypofunction of the adrenal, then it's Addison's disease. Brown is pigmentation of the skin. But more important that we have to decide or differentiate hypo um, additions disease which is primary from the secondary that is pan hypopituitarism or one of them is Sihan syndrome. The brown, if the pigmentation of the skin is there most likely it is a part of the primary adrenal efficiency whereas if it, there is no pigmentation it is a very uh, uh, softy skin, silky skin appearance then probably the you are suffer, patient is suffering from 
secondary or uh, uh, pituitary hypoparathyroid uh, uh, pituitary uh, hypothyroidism and or part of the pan hypopituitarism the change distribution of the hair also uh, problem and there is um, persistence of postural or persistent low blood pressure hypoglycemia weight loss and so many thing but most of the time what they present both primary and secondary addition's disease there is a additional crisis what happened profound fatigue dehydration vascular collapse renal shutdown recurrent vomiting and pain abdomen which may be a features of hypocortisolism may be a presentation of adrenal disease addition's disease or adrenal crisis so any patients having a persistent vomiting having low bp which cannot be correlated with the uh, um, amount of vomiting uh, you have to think of addition's disease either primary or secondary now the just opposite is your adrenal uh, hyperadrenalism or cushing's disease this is a classic which is pathognomonic almost of uh, addis, uh, the, the cushing syndrome is the purple stri no other disease you can find this purple stri uh, in the abdomen it's a abdomen is pedunculated and you can find the red striation in the abdomen there is also bruisability and ecchymosis throughout the body fat fat is changes and it is thinning of the uh, I, i mean the limbs and increase abdominal deposition in the anterior abdomen red cheeks moon faces classical red moon faces is a classical of hyperadrenalism and because of the excess uh, secretion of the cortisol you can have features of diabetes mellitus which is secondary as well as the changes in the bone leading to the osteoporosis of the bone and even bone fracture so uh, this is also very very important interesting cases so we have to think in this thing now the, we are going to polyglandular syndromes we have three types mainly you do not have to uh, stress yourself to uh, make it memorize but it's a just uh, introduction for this type because it will be a very important for the later part of your life the main one main two and main two a two has been divided to a and to b main one is a pituitary adenoma parathyroid hyperplasia and pancreatic tumors is a polyglandular hyperplasia whereas main two is a parathyroid hyperplasia medullary carcinoma thyroid and pheochromocytom main two b is a mucosal neuromas morphonoid body habitus medullary thyroid carcinoma and pheochromocytoma now another is autoimmune polyglandular uh, syndromes like type 1 type 2 type 3 and type 4 in type 1 uh, chronic candidiasis hyperparathy hypoparathyroidism autoimmune adrenal insufficiency at least two of them should be present in aps type 2 autoimmune adrenal uh, insufficiency must always be present along with autoimmune thyroid disease and or type 1 diabetes mellitus in th- aps type 3 autoimmune thyroid disease plus other autoimmune diseases including autoimmune adrenal insufficiency hypoparathyroidism and chronic candidias aps type 4 two or more organ specific autoimmune diseases which do not fall into type 1 to 3 or 3 now some rules of blood test when and how you do the blood test hormone assays is highly sensitive test so it should be done with all the precaution that are followed and procedure and protocols to be maintained uh, acetage hormone is a heterolabile so it should be maintained like this hormone assay must be done at particular time of the day like morning cortisol hormone assay may require some hypo hyperdynamic i mean dynamic maneuvers like hypoglycemia for gh growth hormone assay like thyroid hormone most of the time it should be done in the empty stomach without patient having any food thank you with this may i stop here and asking any questions uh, and any feedback from your end i'm dr professor sibindu ghos joined as a professor of medicine in month of june thank you very much